I'd like to thank Jeffrey personally for the uh, hair piece. I think that's appropriate. Oh. Not sure what it says, but we'll show you later. That's good. Can you hear it both? Yeah. Okay. We don't know how far we have to stand. So um, we started five years ago, as Anne says, and the uh, to be sort of a common topic, but we all work around the uh, around the single table. This is our office at the moment. Uh, there's a couple of us uh, around the, around the single desk, and the uh, I think that's uh, fr from the get go. Johanna and I, uh, when we first got together and talked about starting an office, we wanted to make something that um, in which we can all collaborate um, and uh, where where we would not be the carriers of the main ideas and the, uh, try, to, try to harvest the ideas from, from around the table. And the, um, I, I'm not sure if you're succeeding in it, but we're definitely trying to do that. And the, uh, we don't know how collaboration would actually work, but we're trying our, um, our best um, attempt at that. Right there. Well, I, I guess maybe I would just say that um, we always get asked about the name, and it's one of those things that we've been told many times, and it's probably the dumbest thing anybody could do in terms of um, branding themselves, because um, it's impossible to remember. But um, but the reason behind it was simply that we, uh, we really wanted this collaborative idea to be um, at the foreground of, of the thinking, and that no one would have to work under the the Herb Abdulovich thing, or Abdulovich. Which is impossible to remember. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's part of the reason. But the other reason is really um, that it is a record in history, it's our incorporation number, and and for somehow it just seemed like an important uh, thing to, to remember years, um, years forward. So uh, here we are, I guess, five years later, and um, and as Anne mentioned, we, we sort of came to Winnipeg um, by fluke ourselves. Uh, both um, having sort of been sent there, but I think one of the things that we always found important is that um, that you know you have to embrace where you are, you have to embrace the context, and, and we think that you can and, and one should attempt to do anything that anybody else could do, let's say from from New York um, in a place like Winnipeg. Sounds quite pretentious, but the uh, I think the idea is a good. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <that's well said. laughs> yeah. There's, there's a, a lot of, like most of our generation of architects in Winnipeg has, has left the city. Uh, we, they used to either go to London, England or Vancouver, so we used to call those either Winnipeg East or Winnipeg West when we go and get together um, with, our, with our classmates over there. But everybody left after a sort of a very long period of our hiatus in architecture in Winnipeg, which lasted for about 20 years. There was no uh, startups in Winnipeg when it comes to architectural offices. There was nobody who was actually interested in, in architectural discourse. So uh, we sort of got our, I think, wings from that, or the, the idea of um, just breaking out and trying to do um, trying to do work that we thought was um, was lacking or missing. Uh, architecture is nowhere, or architecture was nowhere to be found on, the, on your cultural radar in Winnipeg at the time. And the, um, so a few things are changing, which are actually quite marvelous. There's a lot of young firms in Winnipeg now trying to do work that's um, out of the ordinary and uh, trying to break that mold. So I think that's sort of a, that, that's sort of very interesting. I don't know how many of you um, have heard of Winnipeg before. Um, it sort of it is located centrally, but that really doesn't mean anything um, in, in terms of North American continent. The, uh, Except your flight tickets are more, more expensive. It takes a day to get to New York and or anywhere else. So it's, it's a bit of a right. when it comes to that. But the, uh, that's what you, Winnipeg looks like, or parts of Winnipeg look like from the uh, from the air, and uh, we uh, we experienced this very interesting sort of climatic uh, challenge uh, where we live between what is it 104 Fahrenheit uh, and then and minus 40 Fahrenheit. So the uh, I think this is correct. Uh, we operate in Celsius up there, and the uh, and it, it, it's quite curious. Uh, we don't get the spring and the uh, the fall really, but we live in summer or winter. So the uh, designing is really less than in geography. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the other, the other thing about Winnipeg that's that, that's very interesting. It's very beige and, and it's very 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 uh, flat and uh, and boring when it comes to, to to its architecture and so on. So there's very few very few gems that that pop at you. So the, the uh, which explains why you wore beige pants when you first arrived in Winnipeg. And I agree. Really so, yeah. His hair was also flat then. So. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the years. Uh, the uh, and then the. Uh, in Winnipeg, you know, we get sort of dumped on uh, in, in the winter, so it, it, the landscape changes entirely, and the way we, we uh, conceive of it changes entirely. 
Leah. So uh, when we started our office, uh, we, we were convinced we are going to keep on doing uh, basement renos and, and kitchen renos for about the first five years, and that, that was definitely what we were ready to do. And the um, and we were convinced that we, uh, there's a reason that no other friends had started for so long. But we were sort of blessed by encountering a bunch of people that wanted to do projects. I think they were thinking very young, and then uh, the, the lower fees. Cheap, yeah. Cheap, and the, uh, yeah, and the, uh, the projects sort of be marginal, which is really what, uh, what they're after, having building in Winnipeg. But we're hoping that we're, we're trying to change some of that, uh, that perception. Yeah, and I guess this map is really just trying to demonstrate that uh, We've somehow um, worked on a lot of very urban projects, uh, I guess what, what is Winnipeg urban, um, and most of our projects are in downtown, um, and so that's the step. This is the downtown map, actually, yeah. 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 So the map of the city. Okay. Sure. So today uh, we're going to talk about um, six projects, it seems. Uh, we're going to try to speed through them because we only have 40, 40 minutes left, I believe. Um, Three of them are housing, and then uh, one is a public menu and, uh, and an office building. And then we're going to talk a bit about the Venice Biennale project uh, we're curating um, for the uh, for this year's Biennale. Um, the first project is um, it's called Center Village. And I, I think this, this next slide is going to sort of illustrate. Hi, I hope you don't mind this. Nice to see you here. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, so it illustrates sort of the, uh, the um, paradox of, of working in Winnipeg uh, in, in uh, November, I think, we were invited to present our project in, uh, in Barcelona for the World Architecture Festival. And the, uh, this is sort of, we were in, in the same category as House 8, that, or 8 House, I'm not sure which is, which is the right uh, acronym, but the, um, we were in the same category in, uh, and this is sort of the comparison. Uh, we always find ourselves uh, really uneasy um, in venues like this or, or at the World Architecture Festival where we to show our, our little projects, and the, uh, we don't think that that's significant at all. So the uh, project itself. So what talk was that? Sorry, well, yeah, I was going to get into it. But okay. Not, okay. No, not this last okay. one. Um, so the project itself is um, just outside of the downtown core, in a in a sort of a war time or pre-war um, housing uh, sector with a very busy road that's uh, cutting in front of it, and. Um, it was, it was worked on as a collaboration with uh, what's called Centre Venture. It's a, it's a city of Winnipeg initiative to try and revitalize the downtown area. And we had the challenge of, uh, of trying to put 25 units onto this six house, um, six house uh, size plot um, that connects Stew Street, Balmoral, which is the, the busy one, and then Kennedy, which is sort of more uh, residential in scale. And that's sort of the view from, the, from across the street, so you're yeah. expecting that. Um, Johanna did the sketch very, very early in the project. So just describing the uh, what was interesting for the client group was the fact that um, the uh, Muslim people, um, just because of the Sharia law, cannot uh, borrow money or, or earn interest and so on. So they were trying to figure out, uh, Central Venture was trying to figure out a way to construct new housing and, and sort of transfer its ownership to, to a group of Somali uh, immigrants and refugees in Winnipeg. So they, they were at the time considering this rent to own arrangement. And the, uh, we were looking into the uh, possibilities of how to create a, a sort of a village within this uh, within this very uh, very tight constraint. Well, the the idea, I guess, being that we've always been interested in is that there there seems to be um, a lack of sort of public space that's being carved out of uh, especially uh, multi-family housing projects in in Winnipeg, and we wanted to find a way that we could reintroduce this public realm to as being part of the city or being building blocks of the city and we tried to figure out a way that we could do that without uh, without incurring a whole lot uh, more cost, um, which is always uh, something uh, we're not able to we're able to do with our clients. So yeah, we started off with this house lot uh, or six house lot uh, site and um, the, the pro forma was that we needed to fit about 25, uh, 25 units, which is not that difficult, but we were limited to three stories in height, uh, maintaining the lowest possible um, cost. Oh. Of the project and the uh, which is your stick wood frame uh, wood frame with the with the concrete uh, foundation. So the uh, we've struggled uh, struggled to do that. Try to do it through uh, through use of your typical townhouses or any uh, any other known um, way of, of fitting the uh, fitting the units on the site or constructing that. And, and the, we're not able. We're always turning to about eighteen to twenty. So we sort of pared it down to. 
to, to the size of the, we, we tried to design it, but then tried to figure out, can we actually put this, um, put this development in. So we, we've um, developed sort of a language, if you wish, or developed the modules of living uh, to try to, to, to attack the project from the, from the sort of from within um, the planning as opposed to from, from the massing or from the distribution. I'm just going to say a quick anecdote. Uh, it's, it's sort of interesting because we, uh, we got, for example, one of these uh, green sustainability guys coming into our office and presenting um, you know, the newest technologies that, um, that they've, they've developed to overcome, um, to overcome energy consumption and, and so on. And yet he was presenting this uh, as being applied to a house that was about 4,000 square feet and him and his wife lived in uh, by themselves. And I, I think it's that sort of suburban uh, sprawl that when it is one of the major problems in Winnipeg. And we're trying to reintroduce now a different living size and trying to, trying to suggest here that uh, perhaps we could get away with less and perhaps densifying the city is, is something that um, we as architects can take part in by simply proposing different alternatives. Put gem X Somalis into well, uh, yeah, exactly. Project. So the uh, so that's we actually terrible. I know it's terrible. That's what it comes out of what you just said. So the, the uh, we decided or figured out that the uh, that the minimum dimension in housing is really eight feet or two point four meters, and then we can work with that when it comes to every space in space in the building except for the master bedroom and living room. So as you can see here, we've sort of configured spaces, and these pictures are of the finished project um, of the interior, and then you can see the master bedroom and the and sort of the living room sticking out uh, of this module. And that's sort of where we started. We counted the modules. We realized that we, uh, how many modules, what the minimum number of modules that we need is. And we said, OK, now we try to, uh, try to fit that on the site. So we started off with the uh, eight foot uh, wide, or narrow bars, if you wish, on the, uh, on the site. And, and just, in essence, try to reconfigure them in order to, uh, to create uh, an appropriate um, density, if you wish, and distribution of site that, that worked, knowing that we wanted to create a street through the through the project, knowing that we wanted to create a courtyard as well for various urban uh, urban design issues, and trying to actually weave the city uh, through uh, through the project as opposed to closing the uh, closing the gates on the property lines. Well, yeah, and I, and I guess one of the things is that even though the units are rather small, there's still um, if, if you're a Winnipegger um, or if you've lived in a northern you know that regardless of the winter being harsh, there's still an opportunity to be outside and, and sort of people wear clothing where it actually is quite feasible. Um, and so our thought is that you know we almost uh, force people into taking part in the public realm, being in a cafe or being on that courtyard and, and trying to really uh, suggest that the, the life continues outside of the, the very private um, realm itself. Right, so the, from, from the original 25 units on this site, we were able to configure them in a way that even left us, uh, left us room for public space on the building, or <coughs> around the building. So the, uh, starting from that context, what we, were, uh, what we came up with is, is, uh, is this alien uh, shape, I guess. And the, uh, the way we, we were able to accomplish this was through, uh, sort of, I think it was a, a three-week exercise for, for two people in trying to see how to fit those modules, how to make those modules into units, and then how to fit those those units on the site. And this is sort of the uh, the outcome and the way the uh, the units are actually actually working. Uh, Johanna mentioned earlier that it's in a relatively rough part of town, so the um, client was very very much ready to build fences around the uh, around the project and connect it from the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, I think that that's where the, uh, the the idea or decision um, to, to create windows or place so many windows on the on the project that actually um, no intruder ever feels that they're they're not being seen by uh, by somebody comes from. So that that's sort of the this is a courtyard image that shows that I don't know how many units are looking at at you and at, at, at all times there's going to be somebody. Uh, yeah, and the windows were standardized so that they could um, they could fit the budget. There's a sort of the standard sizes that you could you could get them sprinkling them throughout. Um, sort of in locations where sometimes they're low and, and kids can see out of them um, more easily, and, and so sort of playing with that as a facade treatment um, would be uh, as much as we could afford in uh, in the project. The other real uh, piece was just paint and, and so that's the that's really the outcome. Uh, we hope that the tree there in the courtyard grows a bit and becomes <laughs> becomes a bit more lively. Um, now the uh, the uh, interesting thing about it there's no IKEA in Winnipeg so all the furniture that people or recent immigrants have is it comes from, from sort of your value village second and third hand shops and so on and they're typically these enormous couches and these enormous um, sofas. 
Two weeks. Puppy? Puppy. Puppy. That's the word. Yeah. Anyway, okay. so yeah. the, um, <laughs> so it's not to laugh, but, but the, the, our project, we like working on, on, on this and, and, and seeing people moving in, and there was this woman who came in with her family, Basically, it started, started bawling when she saw how small the uh, how small the units are because her her couches and her furniture just would not fit. So the you know there's all kinds of good things that you're trying to do as an architect and they, they don't always work. It's all what you find out. People are happy living there, but it's um, those kinds of experiences that also help us keep us humble and think about our mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, the next one is uh, you can I'm just going to cut it right here because otherwise I don't think I'll get a chance. Um, this project is just on the east side of the downtown area, along the Brent River, which is, I guess, the main uh, river that runs through the city north-south. Uh, and um, and uh, what's happened in the recent years is, is that the city has started developing uh, rather expensive condos along that river in the Winnipeg scale anyway, and it's become uh, quickly gentrified. Um, and those are typical sort of apartment block types. And, and what we try to experiment with our client here who's a former house builder, um, and so he was used to doing custom houses, and he had his trades that were, were used to this kind, of, this kind of construction. I think most importantly, we just had a discussion about the, sorry, more importantly, we had just had a discussion with one of our colleagues uh, about Hell's Kitchen that's going through sort of the gentrification. And you can imagine about one block of Hell's Kitchen, that's sort of the size of this area, and uh, we, have, we have everything um, from sort of high end housing to red light district, which is happening right under the bridge. Yeah. On the uh, on the very end, so our site, which, um, which sort of this long site right here, which goes from the bridge to sort of gentrified area. So it's it's quite curious, quite interesting work for uh, sort of place to develop. I thought I, I thought we agree. I would be on the point. Yeah. Thing. No, yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, the idea was that uh, somehow we needed to figure out a way that uh, a bigger demographic could afford these uh, these houses because because of the gentrification and. And um, it was important for us to figure out a construction method where he then could use the trays that he was used to using and, and so forth. And um, we decided that early on that even though it might be maybe more efficient for us to, to do a single block, um, we wanted to experiment with how we could get 18 units and 18 parking stalls onto the site uh, and still keep it to the manageable scale for him so he could face the project and he could, he could again keep using the construction methods that he had. So we came up with the idea of iPod. Yeah, the, uh, right. the, uh, this was, uh, while we were going through the process, we, we, we were trying to figure out, is there a way for us to sort of speak to that individuality as well, since we've got the lead on to, uh, on to trying to, to build a smaller project? Is there a way for us to Well, individually, to build within, within that sort of uh, decided or designed formula of the iPod, right? Mm -hmm. so, the, mm -hmm. so you assembled, uh, assembled the iPods from our students uh, one day. Uh, this is sort of fairly early in the iPod generation design and we were able to actually have everybody have different iPods so I actually spoke a bit about the individuality and the, the final project is is sort of collection of, of individual towers if you wish. Uh, four story towers it is. Uh, yeah there's two uh, two real uh, footprints of them. They're 20, uh, 20 feet by either 28 feet or 18 feet um, and then uh, those are the three, th three or four stories, and of course, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we couldn't really in wood, wood construction in the Winnipeg bylaws go into four-story buildings, so we ended up sinking this down by two feet, um, and, and using then um, an, an elevated, six-foot elevated um, concrete walkway as a sort of public ground on, uh, from which you would enter into a unit and either go down one, one level or go up three uh, three levels uh, to your to your living quarters or through the three levels. And each one of these, of course, is is its own townhouse, um, and the parking is located uh, underneath that uh, concrete deck. Uh, the reason for the elevation of the deck was was um, strategic in a sense of fitting the parking there, but also trying to lift it off of the street. We talked about that red light strip district, so somehow. It was separating itself uh, just enough from the street that it wouldn't, it would not have to be gated off, but feel feel that private. Is for the time being, so the uh, I think the idea is that the connection between the deck and the street uh, is, is is always going to be present there. At the moment, it might might uh, sort of speak to, to safety and, and security, and in the future, hopefully, it's going to speak to the uh, to, to the public public nature of the project. But it's again the, the, this idea of, of weaving public. Life or leaving the city through the uh, through our projects, and the if you'll just look at this diagram. I'm going to show it again. Is the uh, is you have this drive? There's a deck that co that covers the parking. That's on the on the first floor. We developed a whole bunch of 
spaces along the street that are hopefully going to turn commercial uh, once there is a need for that and so on. And the, uh, on top of the, uh, on top of all the boxes, or all, on top of all the cubes, is, the, is another public realm, which you're going to see uh, in pictures as well, which is the public uh, sort of network of, of roof decks. So every, every unit is equipped with one, uh, just generating another level of, of interaction between the people that live there. So. And, and while these boxes are quite generic from the outside, we tried to develop a strategy on the inside then that we could add another layer of typology or different types of units within it. So uh, we thought of living as, as being sort of continuous strip of, of functions and, and then trying to coil that up into, into these rather uh, mundane boxes and, and onto that then uh, the living, the dining. Uh, the sleeping um, habits, and as, as it touches the outside core of the, the form, it, it turns that into window. So in a, in a way, um, we felt that then the facade wouldn't be composed as a sort of an artistic piece, but really would be a generation of that geometry inside. So all, all of a sudden our, our sort of house builder goes crazy and doesn't know how to build all this uh, framework. So the, uh, we went in and built all the, um, all the frame frame models for the project just describing how the uh, how the framing is supposed to work to, you know, in order to generate this form within and so on. And the, um, they were able to build the first space so far, so that's good. So that's what the project looks like from uh, from above uh, in, a, in a rendering. And then the, uh, some of the, uh, the spaces within the, uh, the... You're not wearing your scarf today. She always wears the scarf for presentations and she's always unhappy about seeing it on the, on the slides there. Anyway, you're it's seeing not nearly as funny as in no, the No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these spaces are, are up to 40 feet tall within, and the, uh, it's sort of a loft-like environment uh, as one ascends up to the, uh, up to the rooftop garden. The, um, and then I guess the best part is here, as you can see, is the downtown roof and beyond. And, um, and the idea, too, was that in half of the units were reversed it so that your living uh, room is actually on the fourth floor. Um, and then your connection with the city, in a way, is reaching towards that uh, was the idea. And, and people seem to be really taking on it, um, or taking to it, I guess I would say that. I'm, I'm in the um, So anyway, um, <coughs> there was a point that I was going to make. Oh, hold on. Oh, uh, yeah, so the, so the big part about this to us, what, what it proved is that the, the clients, while they set up to sell it for, for quite a good per square foot price, um, they, uh, they quickly discovered that, uh, that they're actually able to, and this made it feasible for him more and more so, they're actually able to sell it for much more than they originally set, it, set out to do. Um, in, in a way, of course, that's a detriment to our objectives, which is to provide affordable housing. Uh, but in a way, um, it also communicates that design can sell, and, and no longer is he selling them for square foot, but he's selling them on the on the sort of all factor of people walking in, and the square footage goes up the window, and it doesn't matter. Great. And the next Yeah, this is your slide. This is Johanna's husband and the developer. The developer is holding the award. This is where we met Kai from uh, from BIG. And the uh, you remember this. Is he right? <laughs> anyway, so one of the, one of the important things for us, uh, being a relatively small community, is uh, is to uh, well, actually that doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, is that, that at the end of each project, we want to be able to, to have a beer, or have a drink with our with our um, with our client, and the, uh, we, we know we're going to put them through the ringer and, and, and challenge them uh, as as construction projects get challenging and so on. But we, we always uh, aim at uh, always aim at that. Right. The um, the next project is, is called Block 10, and the, um, that's the same developer who said, well, I, I need to build something that's less, less complicated. Um, and the, uh, he came up with the idea, of why don't you design something really nice and modern and, and simple, and we'll put it on the market on a lot, and, the, um, and we'll, we'll try to sell it as a, something, entirely, uh, some, something entirely different. So the lot that they picked is uh, right in the middle of the, of the coast for neighborhood with the uh, along the, one of the arterial roads, so um, as you can see on the map there. It's one of the more suburban projects that uh, we've been involved in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the thought here was that he would experiment something differently on the market uh, by, by uh, introducing the idea of the white box so that each one of the unit owners then could, could go and customize it the way that they, they wanted. Um, and a problem for us, of course, is what was that how do we then um, add enough sort of conceptual strength to the to the product so that we can get something out of it. 
and we can really do something interesting uh, from it. And, and we try to sort of really figure out what can we add to already uh, sort of some of the things that we've done in a three-story walk-up. Uh, multi-family housing typology. So I think, uh, I'm not sure how common three-story walk-ups are here, but in, in Canada Probably they're very so common because they, you don't need to do the, uh, you don't need to have an elevator, it can be built out of wood. Uh, it falls within the code uh, code uh, section that, that uh, allows you to, to, to build cheaper without uh, life safety systems and so on. So it's very important. Well, plus uh, there's, no, uh, there's no public space that you have to maintain, and so no extra square footage that you're building that you would have to sell. So this is very attractive to the development. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but within the within the within the box that we were given or we were able to uh, to construct with, uh, we asked ourselves what is the way to configure the units. And then instead of going into flats or townhouses, we've uh, we've discovered that if you're able to stagger the units or stagger the parts of the units throughout the building, we're not only able to get uh, get most uh, units to the corner, uh, but you're able to get them all to have the, to be double aspect and so on. So each one of the units is actually. Um, consists of three rooms, uh, so there's there's ten units in in uh, in the building, and uh, by three rooms, uh, sort of equates to 30, um, 30 modules. So on each side we have fifteen modules uh, facing either the back uh, of the lot or the street, and the, they're connected via stairs that that actually uh, contain all the uh, all the building systems. And within that, each one of the modules was in, we were able to to make it. Uh, flexible in a way that each one of the modules could consume any role uh, that it would need in, in, in a household or in a, in a dwelling. So the, the, by the virtue of how we place the installations and the, uh, the water and, uh, and sewer, uh, the, the one could place the kitchen or in any one of the modules, one could place the, the, the bathroom in any one of the modules and so on. So I think the realtor is still trying to figure out what you know to switch. She never did. Uh, she never did. The, uh, she's, she's gotten sold, so that's yeah. the good news. So that's in essence is the is the building, and you can sort of see how uh, each one of the units takes on its own shape <coughs> within the same system um, of thinking. We were fascinated by this idea, of course, uh, so sort of different unit owners, different characters, um, living right next to one another and sort of brushing by in that uh, common corridor. Um, cowgirls loving it. The, uh, but again, so one of what. Going back to the Hollywood Squares uh, diagram, I think what, what is important to us is 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 to, is to think about the uh, the ways to uh, to get these people to know each other within the uh, within the project. And typically, you know, through through virtue of a street or a courtyard, we're able to to, to introduce uh, neighborhoods to one another if we uh, if they're walking by or getting to their units. Here, each of the units is sort of entered from a different angle and so on, so it is quite different. So two things work for our uh, to our advantage. One of them is um, the stairs, the way they're intertwined as people understand the project. And actually, um, units typically will touch two or three units uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, other, in a, units. other units in a project. In this units, they're touching either six or seven, and there's uh, hopefully there's sound where the sound can transfer. And we've sort of designed it that way a bit, so the stairs are actually really? a place where, well, in the stairs, the stairs are where the, where the sound will be heard, and that they're that separated uh, from uh, from the living and sleeping quarters. Uh, Quite well, but the idea was that that people need to understand that they that they, they live um, next to each other and, and so on. And, and the then on the other side, yeah. sorry. Look. The public realm in this case is reduced to a fair minimum, but it still exists. And so we were trying to play with the with the exterior skin um, that you can sort of see pulled off from the the unit itself. Um, so there's the screen. Uh, that envelopes the, the whole project, and, and between that skin and the actual envelope of the building uh, is where that public uh, space exists, and sort of just slightly hidden behind the exterior. So as, as with every screen, that's the first thing that, uh, that's uh, going to be uh, cut from your project, and especially when the clients are sort of seeing the, uh, the project taking shape and saying, well, this massing is good enough uh, for, the, uh, for the project, probably we don't require the screen. And the, uh, Somehow we've uh, we've uh, stuck up to that, and the uh, when the building, whatever, stuck to it. Um, yeah, stuck to that, and, yeah. and as the building is uh, or has gotten completed, we were able to get the screen um, on the project, and it's interesting that it creates it creates this this sort of odd uh, public or private environment, especially because of the way the, the wood slides work, uh, and the uh, from when you're on the deck, you can see how the people are driving by. Actually, it blocks most of the most of the views, so it, it creates. Quite a um, public space uh, within within that uh, six foot um, space all around the building, and w which has become the uh, the place where, where people um, can connect with each other and, and uh, actually communicate to their to their neighbors. 
Um, I guess then we'll move on to um, the Old Market Square stage. Uh, this project is located right in the heart of the downtown, of historic downtown Winnipeg. We have a small area that's called the um, Exchange District, actually, UNESCO Rural Heritage Site. Um, it has a lot of these turn of the century or um, uh, warehouse buildings that are now converted into, into lofts and, and workspaces and artist living quarters. So the it was a sort of invited competition, or invited competition uh, for, for the architects that were operating in the area. We were actually lucky enough to have our offices located there. And the, um, it was to replace the old stage that you can see here on the bench shelf, if you wish. And the, uh, we sort of jumped onto this opportunity because, because we thought this was a great project that could actually make, um, not make us any money, but make us a lot. It was a lot of fun and joy to, uh, to do. Mm -hmm. So you know, Han and I both live upstairs yeah. from, from, from the park, actually. So we have a very intimate knowledge of how the, uh, how the space works and so on. So we were very excited. We said nobody else is going to build in our backyard. So we thought, OK, we've got to figure out a way to, to get this. It's not exactly how it went down. But nevertheless, I guess the fact that we're looking at the park uh, 365 days of the year, and it only was active uh, a fraction of that time, uh, sort of made us feel like we um, there's got to be something more that we can in infuse into the program than just it being the band show. And somehow we had to make it alive and, and have it come alive um, other times of the year as well. Uh, Winnipeg, of course, is very seasonal uh, in a sense that all those events take place in the summertime and then in the wintertime the, the park is quite sad and, and, and the empty band show sort of begs the, the question is where, where is everybody? Um, we then developed uh, a couple of different schemes um, for the project that eventually what ended up happening is that the, the competition um, organizer ended up picking the scheme that they, they liked the most and that was the, the, the cube. Right, so the, where, where it all started was the, the, the idea of, well sort of started, the idea that the fascination can, uh, can be created through myth. Through myth, I, I guess, and the, you know, when you think of the Odyssey, uh, 2000, no, 2001 Odyssey, yeah, that's the uh, and the idea of the uh, of the obelisk and the uh, and sort of the, the fascination that we can all have with that. Uh, we were thinking, is there a way for us to create an object, an urban object, if you wish, that that will create that or maintain that fascination for the uh, for the people in the city, and then also, but we also knew that it has to be something hiding uh, behind the sort of the the outside makeup, if you wish, inside the uh, something with a bit of heart and soul. So the very early, uh, as Johanna mentioned, the, uh, we sort of settled on the idea of the cube as the most rudimentary uh, shape or, or form, um, sitting in the landscape as the most stable one. But we've, we've tried to figure out what that soul is and how do we how do we deal with that? Right, but where the cube came from really is the idea that it could that the form itself seemed like it, it contained something or, or that it would have a life that you couldn't tell whether it was empty or full inside and, and, and that was part of the premise of the, of the very rudimentary object itself. So what we settled on was the sort of this amorphous shape in concrete that, that provides the structure for the space, provides the uh, acoustical backdrop and provides uh, sort of delineation of spaces within the, uh, within the cube. And it was skinned with, um, or it was going to be skinned with the, uh, this custom skin that we were developing with a hunter in colony uh, just outside of the city and then uh, trying to figure out how to, how to do that. So the, um, this is what the cube looks like uh, now. Uh, it's, uh, it's lit from within, which, is, uh, which was very critical to us and the, uh, uh, for it to, to, to sort of try to, to demonstrate or to show that it, um, it, all its power comes from within. Um, and there's uh, the idea was that we would um, we would find some uh, simple motion sensors and things like that. So we change the lights, and it would it would become alive as you're interacting with it, or come near it, and, and so on. What it packs inside is sort of the programmatic elements that were required by the client, and we also introduced the rooftop stage that came out of the geometry as as we were working through that, and it also um, houses a green room for performance. So everything seems to be so everything is packed within the. Uh, and then the proper of the 28-foot cube. Um, one other uh, aspect of it, we were trying to extend its life through the, uh, through the, uh, through the seasons in Winnipeg by introducing different types of, of um, events that can happen here. We've had everything but um, an exhibition so far, so the, uh, the people are trying to learn how to use this. Uh, the area is sort of not being gentrified entirely yet, so uh, there's a lot of artists in the area that we're trying to, uh, one of the attempts <coughs> with the cube was to try to create sort of a canvas on which um, artists can, 
can react. There's a couple of them that, that uh, took that on and they're using the projector that's within the cube and that allows us to, to, to project onto the scan and so and on. And the client is very happy with the fact that it could be secured and it could be, um, you know, some of that equipment, the projectors and, and things that they use in the lighting uh, would be safe from, uh, from vandalism this way. It was very, one other thing that was very important to us as we were trying to figure out what and how did this cube open to, uh, to become a stage was to realize that uh, whatever we did, uh, to open the, the, the stage and it actually opened outwards, it kind of decomposed the, uh, the, the notion or the nature of the cube. So we worked extremely hard to figure out how can we actually suck in the, um, the exteriors in order to exterior in order to, uh, to create a stage. So this is what the, um, these slides are kind of out of order, but the, this is what it looks like once the, once the skin is pulled in uh, to create a stage. You're going to see some, uh, some images from the outside as well. Uh, but it's used for interior events as well and, and so on. Uh, we've had quite a few parties in there. Um, and then there's also the um, upper stage that you saw the stair right. uh, actually leading to. And this is the um, this is sort of the the, uh, the way it looks uh, during an event uh, in Winnipeg uh, during the what's called the French French festival and the theater festival and the jazz festival. Uh, this space this place just goes wild, and that's the only time where Winnipeg feels like a real city. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it's sort of fancy streets, etc. Uh, are somewhat beige, but the, we love Winnipeg. Uh, we still love it. The um, and then the, uh, the, the, the stairs go outside and the, the space is really, the, space, the magic of the space is, is, is within, in between the, uh, the, the skin and the, uh, and the outside. And the, uh, this is sort of the, the performance space is seen from the, uh, from the eyes of the performers into the, into the park. Um, this is the only picture we have all upstairs that's, uh, they invited us to pose in, uh, for, for some magazines. So, so that's why there's people, but there's bleachers and that's the stage upstairs. I think a very interesting part of the of the project is the skin itself, and the, uh, a lot of projects that we work on don't have enough budget for anything. So um, we usually don't have enough money to, to even plan a building. So often we resorted to figure out the what? cheaper ways to do that. Yeah, okay. right? well, that's sort of the point. I nice said. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, and so so we 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 started working with the Sutterite Colony about five years ago that was able to do anything uh, out of metal or out of, of uh, out of plastic. And so for this project, we, we told the client, we're going to figure out something. Uh, you just have to give us enough time. So working with them, we've come up with a relatively simple um, extrusion uh, that, uh, that did two, two things that are very important. One of them is it needed to reflect light uh, from the inside to the outside, both projector and the lights. It, uh, it needed to be um, connected in a way that is flexible, so it actually would allow us to pull the, uh, pull the skin in. And it needed to turn a corner. So that's where this sort of a 45 degree um, uh, geometry salami comes slice. from, which is salami slice. So we invented the entire extrusion. Uh, it's actually a 30 and a 60 degree extrusion that would cut at the right angle of the squares. It actually and transfers the image that's projected from the inside to the outside, which was, uh, which I guess was the real discovery. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was sort of a happy accident. We're playing with uh, with some metal that had thickness, and then realized as we were projecting on it that the image gets sort of carried. Uh, through the thickness of the material, and then we uh, did a whole bunch of um, MDF mock-ups uh, with different um, perforations, and then discovered that you know some sort of louver or Venetian blind type of thing actually even in MDF will transfer the image. That was quite a quite sort of an interesting breakthrough. So this was prepared for a British publication, which which makes sense. But we were able to uh, sort of with the projector inside the stage, we were able to project on the outside of the. Uh, of the stage. So it, it can be this very static object, if you wish, um, uh, or can be animated either through projections or through use. And so there's no LED, so there's none of that, so it actually really was quite a, mm -hmm. quite a cheap uh, trick. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we've tried to, to see if we can use the LED, um, LED screens and so on for, for the skin and uh, that's at the outside of the budget. So the, uh, this is uh, an event, this is an orb, the band orb at the Cube uh, last summer. Uh, so the place goes. Path, I think, and the, uh, the, the cube house is the orb fairly well, so you can see the scale and the, uh, and the type of it a bit. And then what, what was most important to us, it actually was able to change back to this quite... Um, quite, an, uh, quite an serene object almost. Um, right, sitting in the, sitting the, in the district. Well, I, I guess that the, the one thing that we're going to get into just uh, in a little moment, um, but um, what's been interesting about this project, because it is in the Historic Exchange uh, District, is that we've had all kinds of uh, discussion that started uh, started as a result of this project and what's appropriate. And all of a sudden, uh, the public seemed to be interested in architecture in Winnipeg, and uh, we've had all kinds of comments from uh, 
Oh, no, it's great, and it's it's magical to to basically see the ugliest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so it's been it's been great for architecture. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did say. Mm -hmm. So the uh, which is sort of another, another thing we got to talk a bit about, which is sort of this idea of advocacy and architecture in a moment. But the last project we're going to show, I think we're really yeah, okay for time still, um, is, is called Vontar, and it's, it's, it's right in the middle of, sure, Beth? Yeah. Yeah, it's right in the middle of parking lots. You can see how many parking lots there is. Our, uh, sure. parking lots, yeah. It's in the parking lots. The, uh, the actual center of Winnipeg is right in the intersection on your top left. <coughs> That's the windiest, yeah, well, sir, I did. Uh, that's the windiest intersection in Canada, apparently. And the, uh, so the, you can see what, that it's surrounded by the sea of parking lots. So our, our uh, client actually picked up the lot for $150,000 and said, what if, asked us what, if, what could we do with it. The, uh, it's very close to Red River, as you can uh, see, see here. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's surrounded by parking lots, and it's sort of in between or flanked by two relatively busy streets that go from the, uh, from the downtown to the French Quarter. Of the city, the site itself uh, sits uh, next to a, an existing one-story building. Uh, it's a very narrow site of 30 by uh, 108 feet. 108 feet, and the uh, so, so the footprint is is just over 3,000 square feet. And the uh, two red walls shown on the top right is are, are actually walls where we cannot have any windows. So the um, the windows well, can are limited to the sides. I think that we are shown should in blue. maybe mention what it's used for and. Yep. Um, Seems like an important thing to plug in. Um, we've sort of noticed that in, in Winnipeg, there's a lot, there isn't a lot of property that a, that a young firm like ours could, could purchase. Um, so condo type of uh, office development. And so that was the premise of the project, that we would be able to sell um, condo um, um, office space and, and small scale. Um, so there's, there's 11, uh, 11 stories, so potentially 11 businesses or even up to 20 businesses because some of them can be divided in, in half and um, that was the thought. So again, we don't really have an interior program at this, that's at this point, it's speculative um, office development. And um, therefore, really, the only thing that we got to play with was the was the exterior. So, the very curious program. We've done another building that did the same thing, where we had no access to the client or the end user. So, we're always trying to sort of invent the narrative for for what it is. So, this is sort of telling you what the project is without you seeing what it is. But what we were able to do is, um, I think, the only thing we could come up with is to, is to punch holes through the building in order to bring light uh, into the into the deep floor space. Uh, uh, and the uh, by, by punching the real holes through the building, we could actually glaze the sides of the holes and therefore bring the light in, into, the, uh, into the project. You can see the project, there's one interesting thing, the most interesting thing about it is the, what's being constructed behind it, which is Museum of Human Rights. Why did you sell it? <laughs> right. Good job. Museum of Human Rights, by, designed by Anton Pridoc, and the, uh, it's quite a crazy building. Uh, we're going to see how it actually turns out. But the, uh, back to our project, the, uh, the five holes that are, that are cut through the building have um, sort of sloped floors. And one of the things that we were trying to, uh, to maintain was the continuity of the floor plate. And we discovered that the only way to do that is to slope the holes uh, within the building so one can actually connect the office space from one side of the hole to another. All these holes become those, uh, those community spaces within the building where different offices can actually congregate if they decide to do so or have, have a beer. Um, at the end of the day. So the, uh, each one of the holes is actually um, informed, if you wish, uh, by the city, uh, by the surrounding city fabric, whether it's the baseball arena or the Museum of Human Rights or, or the most important intersection. Different uh, ownership scenarios are, are certainly possible, and that's uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the ways we've, uh, we've divided the building in pieces. Um, this is sort of the, uh, we're trying to speak to this, this is sort of a sexy rendering, I guess, that doesn't sell. Uh, it shows where the holes are, and the uh, this is a couple of rendering showing the nature of the, these places uh, where interaction ha can happen between the uh, between the offices. Uh, the building gives back to the city not only through the holes, but it, it becomes a um, becomes a billboard as well, uh, in particular because of its location in the city. So the uh, we started doing experimentation of what it could do actually as a, as a, as a place. I'm not sure what this one. Anyway. And the, um, that's sort of it in situ uh, as it would be against work. All right. Um, so then lastly, we just wanted to touch briefly on the, the Venice Biennale in architecture. This is a project that, uh, as uh, was mentioned there in the introduction, um, it first started from the idea that uh, the three of us, uh, that being Sasha, myself, and our collaborator, 
Jae Sung Chong, uh, are, are originally from other places, and we wanted to see how migration and immigration had affected the, the architectural scene in, in Canada. And uh, we wanted to map out who's out there, who's practicing architecture, and what kind of work is that producing. And uh, the device for that exploration then became the uh, uh, nationwide open competition for young practitioners under 45 uh, to submit work that um, you know, would do uh, two things. Uh, one was a three minute video uh, of themselves. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And just a quick premise of okay. the project. So that they would submit this video and, and talk about who they are and, and where they came from and then produce an architectural model um, of a housing uh, dwelling that then somehow was uh, described in that in that video. So anyway, so that was a competition, and then of course, Venice being uh, one of the most important architectural expositions in the world, um, we always say that even you know my grandma knows about it back in Finland, and we wanted to somehow figure out a way that we could reintroduce uh, the Biennale to the Canadians and and well, have introduced because it never was. Yeah, sorry. Introduce, not Nobody me. knows about what's going on with Ben Ali. And we, we talked to, to your team for this year, your curator team for this year, about a couple of weeks ago. And the one thing that gave us a, a real good um, chance to do this properly was the fact that they awarded it uh, in February last year, so about a year ago. So we had, uh, since February last year, uh, we had enough time to organize, plan, think, and figure out how to do all this while the, while the American one was awarded when couple months ago, mm -hmm. and then now they're on their, their own fundraising campaign and so on. So it's a very onerous task when it comes to that. Yeah, and this, is the, uh, this is the Canadian teepee in the Giardini Gardens in, in Venice, and uh, existing pavilions built in the 60s, and, and somehow we have to inhabit this very specific space. Um, and again, uh, the theme being uh, this how we move around the globe, we thought would be very uh, a very important uh, topic in architecture these days. Uh, you know, Canadians come from all kinds of places in the world, and we practice globally, uh, uh, globally uh, these days. And we try to figure out what what does that mean, and, and how is that appropriate, and, and what do we as cultural beings uh, bring to the table that way? Um, and then the competition itself, of course, was uh, Canadian wide. And even if you were someone uh, who was Canadian and practicing somewhere else in the world or living somewhere else in the world, you could participate. That's a map of Canada. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More geography lessons from Sasha. And then, uh, in order for, for to get this uh, public uh, public participation, we wanted to tour the project from coast to coast uh, before it actually goes to Venice, and so. The way uh, this worked out then is that each one of the uh, regions had their own exhibition and they had their own jury um, of selection. So in the end, we would end up with Team Canada, uh, who, who ends up going to, to Venice. So Halifax, for example, had their, um, I don't know, a dozen or so entries, and then they would be a local jury there. They're some of their best known architects selecting uh, these young people to move forward. So the beauty, I think the beauty of it was that it actually connected the architectural community throughout the country. We're getting uh, people who are up, up to 45 years of age to uh, participate in the competition. Canadians were very generous, as, as usual, and we had, we had over 120 entries uh, in the competition among practitioners and students. So that enabled us to run all the shows and enabled us to run the competition at a sort of appropriate scale. And then the uh, older established architects are doing two things, either helping out helping us financially or helping the project financially through uh, very generous uh, donations and then also helping with their time, connecting us to the, to the industry leaders. They're also help, giving us money and also... Are you making it sound like everybody's just everybody pouring just money, money into us. Yeah, and, then yes. the, uh, <laughs> and secondly, they're acting on the jury. So we got the, uh, the leading Canadian architects are actually jurors on this competition. We've assembled we have a national jury next week in, uh, in Winnipeg. The, uh, the other seven shows, uh, regional shows, have have uh, closed and uh, have been... Have produced 26 have been regional winners who then will be narrowed down by the final jury probably though to, to have. Right. And of course, uh, as in the U.S., I've heard uh, the the uh, Biennale comes with the big challenge, which is that fundraising, and, and this tour uh, through Canada helped us do the fundraising, and, and as architects are no experts in fundraising, but I realized that we sell our, our ideas all the time, and this is no different. So uh, we bought that too, right? So we've toured from boardroom to boardroom through the last uh, uh, eight months or so, begging for money from anyone and everyone we know. 
Um, but then on, on to then what we as curators did, um, we then created a landscape onto which, um, out of wood, onto which then these new immigrants, the authors of the, of the work, would, would uh, settle into. And we devised this rather simple system of uh, 12 by 12, 6 by 6, 3 by 3, 1 and a half and 1 and a half by uh, pieces of wood that could then be assembled into, uh, into plots by the authors. And, and this comes uh, from the idea that we feel that in Canada, uh, we are allowed to affect our surroundings and we're allowed to really make our surroundings what they are. We're not asked to assimilate to a culture, but we get to celebrate who we are really uh, to the fullest extent of the word, we feel. And we think this is a value that we can export. So um, the entrants then uh, got to decide how their plot would look like, how their land formation, uh, whether it's sort of physical, <coughs> social, cultural uh, context, would, would appear within this uh, collective, um, collective ground. And these are just some of the inspirational images that uh, we have posted as part of the competition on our website. And what we received then, uh, the competition closed originally uh, October 1st, that uh, we received quite a variety of of works that we see a sampling of here. And uh, one thing that surprised us is how really very personal these stories are and how uh, people had had such variety of experiences and then somehow trying to put that into architectural form that's not very flashy. It's actually what I think that's sort of what we find the most interesting <coughs> is the, uh, a lot of these projects, since we asked the designers and architects to, to come up with the ideas that actually reflect who they are uh, on, on a cultural level and, and, and on their heritage level. They, they dug deep and came back with, with constructs that, that actually were not uh, what we're used to today, which is this, this is flashy image driven or, or the, um, um, I guess, projects that we, that we see in, in, in publications. And that really talked back to us as the organizer about how, uh, where perhaps the interests lie. We're trying to figure out where the future of Canadian architecture is through engagement of, of young architects, but we're trying to see if. Um, Oh, sorry, trying to figure out where, where, where does it go. So Johanna split through a several several exhibits. One other aspect, aspect, very important aspect of this project was the fact that we tried to um, engage the public and um, in, 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 in the um, or with the exhibit or with the architecture because there is very little about architectural discourse in Canada. And the, uh, by by placing the exhibits in public spaces like the uh, Brookfield Place or the DC Gallery by designed by Santiago Calatrava in Toronto. 100,000 people see it every year. Um, every was, day. Every day. It was extremely important to the, uh, to the, to the nature of the project and the idea of connecting the public to, to architecture. And then we're also collecting uh, migration stories uh, from people on our website. Uh, so it would be interesting to hear from some of you as well. Um, to contribute one, so whether one has anything to do with the design field, uh, the idea was that you could just simply log on and this would become the sort of memory book of the, of the Canadians um, um, as the project unfolds. And then uh, we got extremely lucky because David Shipperfield announced the, uh, the theme of the Biennale uh, for 2012 and it happens to be common ground and I think there's a lot here that we can, we can build on and extract on and, and now once we come to the final sort of formation of what, the, what our exhibit is going to be about, uh, some of these ideas are going to be embedded in it. Mm -hmm. And then briefly in conclusion. And yeah, lastly, the, um, I, I think this goes back to this advocacy that uh, sort of we, we made sure that our practice five years ago when we started, it's not about our project, but it's about architecture in Winnipeg. These are not our projects. Um, the last one is designed by KPMB in Winnipeg, who are Canadian architects, if you wish, and the uh, Kubarp in um, Bloomberg McKenna. And yeah, they've designed a building for Hydro, uh, Hydro Manitoba. The, uh, the building on the top right is the, uh, is the building, is our new airport designed by Cesar Pelli. The bottom right is the, um, is the rendering of uh, what the museum is supposed to look like by, uh, by Anton Preda. And the, uh, Winnipeg is quite fortunate to have buildings uh, of this stature being built because nothing was really happening there for about 20 years. But I guess that our point here is that it, we're trying to sell the public the idea that architecture does exist in smaller projects too and, and should exist and, and somehow that we need to pay attention to this and, and we try to uh, extract architecture or design quality out of smaller, um, smaller projects too. Um, um, well, sorry, we can just keep, keep on the people have read this. The, uh, uh, what we're up against are the projects that you see on the top left. Uh, that's not our project. And the, um, that's typically <laughs> what architecture um, is considered to be in Winnipeg. Uh, people do not understand exactly what architects do. The, well, 
we're not we're not commenting on its architectural value. I think we're commenting here on its value of contribution to the city and the uh, the the inability of the project to actually contribute to the city and what really uh, what really is hurting us. The, uh, we often question our, our, our fellow citizens, I think, Winnipeg, on, on what is it that we are leaving to, uh, to the generations from, uh, from here on. On the left, you see one of uh, uh, the Hudson Bay building um, that's in Winnipeg that is uh, one of the original department stores that were built about 100 years ago. Today, we, uh, Winnipegers mostly dominantly, predominantly shop at Walmart that looks like the building on the right. The building on the left has obviously a 100 plus year uh, lifespan. The building on the right probably has a 20 year. Lifespan, and those are the questions we keep asking our our clients and our. our and, uh, this particular one is uh, uh, the one on the um, on the right hand side is our project for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, and and on the left is is the building they produced before for the same uh, same budget, and uh, we actually got hauled into the boardroom um, sometime uh, through the design process to be told that that our building looked too fancy and that uh, the public would have a, a strong reaction to this because it would be seen as a wasting of uh, public funds. And we see we see that our public agencies are the ones that actually have to take the uh, take the ownership, have, have to take the leadership when it comes to the way we create our, uh, right, our I, environment. And but I, I thought you were going to say that it was actually the same budget. Oh, oh, sorry. That's the two right. buildings are on the same budget. Uh, what we did well, after they sort of summoned them in, in the border and told us to redesign, we just produced uglier drawings, actually. So our presentation drawings were far less flashy. We, we reduced them to, to grayscale and did, did sort of drawing as opposed to regular design. So they said, okay, well, that looks better. And we, uh, <laughs> so we got to the building and we sort of mm -hmm. wanted to do. But I, I, I think this, again, this part of the presentation is very dear to, to, to Winnipeg and we keep on regurgitating this message in, in, the, in the public over there that we can do uh, better if we push our uh, architects uh, harder. It's not only uh, yeah. and this up to budget. And then th this last one too, last year there are two projects that were awarded the top design award for unbuilt projects in Canada. One was a hospital uh, that actually had the same clients that, that we had after uh, for our building. And then the other one is our project uh, on um, on the right there, uh, one one is a two hundred million dollar project. The other one is a million dollar project. And the uh, this was the, this is the message, or this carries a message to, to to the community that doesn't matter how large the project is, doesn't matter if it's public or private money. There is a way. We just have to find what that way is. Is to create projects that are actually married to the city. And there are great things going on in Winnipeg. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, it's our entry to the warming huts along the the longest river trail, uh, skating trail in the. Uh, in the world, and uh, the, it's now become an international competition, which you can enter next year. Um, should. Should enter next year. So it's, it's to design a warming hut, uh, a place where you could actually get away from the wind and the, and the cold and, and um, um, rest while you're, while you're taking the skating trail. And our, our project was called the Sunspot, so it was just a, a steel frame that was skinned with, uh, with snow fences and then uh, iced over uh, with the hose and, and we had an artist friend of ours, uh, Eva Tarsha, painted this nice uh, bright orange and then you could crawl into the bottom of it um, and actually stick your head in and sit on the on the bottom. Right the warming huts are a real phenomenon because the, uh, right now we have 12 of them because two were burned last year. Uh, one, of the, uh, one, of, one of the teams from New York actually, their, their, their piece uh, built out of straw bale got burned last year which is quite interesting. A phenomenon in itself, a real, a real warming hut finally, but the development <laughs> on, the, on the river and the um, last, or this year we had uh, Sam Gary, uh, the son, son of Frank Gary, come in and construct one uh, designed by Frank Gary uh, this past year. So the, uh, it, it's sort of gaining momentum and we're trying to figure out who the next year um, start will be. And then uh, just the second uh, last slide, um, we are also uh, working on uh, what's called On the Boards uh, initiative in Winnipeg where architects get together every month to talk about their work in the pre-design stages, try to critique each other's uh, production and then uh, try to raise the bar and the level of architecture in the city. So it's worked out great. Uh, we have about 50 to 80 uh, people attend every month and uh, given that we only have about 150 uh, registered architects in the city, we think that's a pretty good batting average. Uh, our last project here is the cheapest project, public project, that we've engaged in. This is uh, four chairs that uh, we used to have in our first office boardroom, and they're just placed on outside of the door of our office, current office. Uh, $49.95 from Ikea, these chairs, and, and used. 
And um, every morning in the summertime, we put them out and set them in different configurations and have some architectural magazines on the seats and, and hope that people stop by. And you can see some interesting readership that we gained. So really, um, it doesn't take much to uh, create spaces, create architecture, great places. So thank you very much.